Hi, so my name is Rob Peters. I'm Chief Architect at Edgecast Networks. And here's what we do. We strive to help your web, web business perform better and faster. This is everything we do. You might notice that fits in pretty well with Velocity's taglines around better, faster, stronger. Uh, and so on that note, let me just say it's really awesome to be here today and have a chance to speak with all of you because many of us from different teams at Edgecast have been coming to Velocity over these last few years, really learning a lot, bringing lessons home, sharing them with our colleagues. It's really paid off for us. And today I just want to talk a little bit about a few of the things that we've learned. Um, to start off, here's a quick look at our network, uh, just so that we have a little context for discussion. So we run a full set of web acceleration products across our extensive global network. Those include HTTP content delivery and application delivery, live and on-demand streaming, DNS, storage, security, analytics. And in all of those areas, areas uh, performance is critical to our success. Um, as I'm sure it is for all of us, that's why we're here at Velocity. So here are a few of the main lessons that we've learned. It's important to measure everything. You got to measure everything so that you can manage your performance and avoid regressions and have a chance to optimize performance, finding new opportunities. You have to pay attention to your outliers. You have to be able to iterate quickly. And I like to summarize it like this with an analogy to the maxim from software development that says you have to be able to reproduce a bug first before you have a chance of fixing it. And the footnote to that is always that reproducing the bug is the hard part. You spend 95% of your time getting there. Once you get to that point, everything becomes crystal clear. You say, aha, and it's all downhill. The bug practically fixes, it yourself, uh, fixes it itself. So if we tweak the language a little bit, I draw a parallel to web performance and say, in web performance, you have to be able to visualize a problem clearly before you have a chance of fixing it, or before you have a chance at seizing an opportunity for a new optimization. Once you can visualize it, it's all downhill. So I'm going to talk through a couple of examples of how this has played out for us. Uh, and to give you fair warning, I'm going to be focused most, mostly on the visualizing part in the interest of time and not so much on the fixing part. Uh, but I'd be happy to talk about that next year. Um, so the first example is about performance management and avoiding regressions in one of our key applications called Sailfish, uh, which is our core HTTP cache proxy engine that runs across our edge network. And it has a really cool logo that you can see here in my shirt sleeve. Um, so this is home to a lot of the advanced functionality that we provide uh, to our content delivery and application delivery customers. And that means that there's great business value uh, in having the flexibility to get new features out the door quickly with frequent releases. Obviously, we want those releases to be very safe, though. And so we try to achieve that safety with lots of different kinds of automated testing and then careful phase rollout to production. So here's a little chart that shows the scientific method that we use for these phased rollouts. Uh, basically, we take a small set of servers, divide them into two groups, one control, one test. And then at some point in time, we apply the new version of the code to the test group. And so that gives us these four quadrants of pre and post crossed with control and test. And then we can use statistical methods across our hundreds of monitor metrics to try to tell us, basically, is there anything wrong in the yellow box? So here's an example of this, how this actually plays out. These are real numbers for some actual rollouts. Um, and these are from one of our key performance health metrics. And so what you see here is pairs of lines. Each one represents a rollout. And you see the numbers from the quadrants that I mentioned. So you've got control and test groups in the, in the two rows. And then you've got values from pre and post intervals in the pairs of columns. And then in each row, we look at the change between pre and post. Uh, and then we can compare those changes between the two groups, trying to understand, is anything different in the test group than in the control group? And we do this across all our metrics. This is just one example. So here's a series of rollouts where everything was uh, going smoothly, very small differences at, at most between the two groups, nothing more than a couple hundredths of a millisecond on this metric. And so these all represent rollouts that were eventually globally promoted to production. And then one day, this happened. Um, we had a new version of code that was in this limited deployment phase. And we saw a larger than usual difference between the two groups. So we scratched our heads for a while. And then we came back to our lessons. We got to measure everything, follow our outliers. And we really had to dig deeper. And in fact, we ended up building a whole new visualization tool to help us understand this case. Um, so that's what you see here. Uh, these are graphs where the control group is in green and the test group is in red. And these are from our three separate HTTP platforms. Uh, you see small object on the left, large object, and then application delivery. So here's the point in time where that new version of code went out to the test group, the red group. And you'll notice there's some curious new bumps on the red graph. Um, but only on this one platform, not on the two other platforms. 
And so this is strange. We're still trying to figure out what's going on. Remember that at this point, the code has already been through all of our automated load testing uh, procedures covering different traffic scenarios. None of those showed any problems. So what's going on? Uh, well, fortunately, we had been to Velocity, and we'd heard the message that you have to not just look at the average, but you've got to also look at the full distri uh, statistical distribution of your metrics. So fortunately, we were also tracking the max and the fifth percentile and 95th percentile of this metric. And this showed an interesting picture. So we see that the bumps are still there on the, on the graphs for the max, but not there for the uh, fifth percentile or for the 95th percentile, and still not in any of the other platforms. And so this, so this is that aha moment. We got to this case. We could see, OK, we have this unique problem affecting only this specific set of requests. We know the 95th percentile on down is not affected. So somehow, the, whatever, whatever the requests were that were the most severe outliers have now gotten slightly more severe in this case. And that, in combination with the fact that this was limited to one platform, allowed us to quickly hone in and find where the problem was. Uh, and it was all downhill from there. Uh, it turned out to be that we were double counting some objects uh, in, our, in our cache inventory, uh, which was causing different than expected eviction uh, patterns. So that was the first example. The second example I want to look at is around TCP stack monitoring and optimization. Um, so for the overall health of many of our products, it's really important that we maintain good connectivity between all of our POPs at all times. And so to do that, we monitor that tech connectivity closely and keep an eye on charts like the one that you see here. Uh, that track latency at loss at multiple layers of the network stack. And as usual, sometimes weird things happen. We'll, we'll be looking at the layer 3 graphs, and there's no packet loss, and latencies are usual. And then we look at the layer 7 graphs, and it's slower than we would expect. But we check the application. The application seems to be forming, performing fine. So what's going on? Well, we can pull out a Swiss Army knife and use TCP dump to dig in, and we can find the problem, and we can maybe fix it. But this is not a repeatable solution. Uh, TCP dump is not a monitoring tool. If we have to go there to figure things out, then it means we're missing something from the monitoring stack. And so at one point, this led us um, to try to do it better. How can we track this in a more repeatable way? So we turned to the man page for TCP, and we came up with this really cool TCP info option that you can pass in a get sock op system call uh, to allow your user space application to retrieve socket level information from the kernel about your socket. So you get really interesting stuff like congestion window size, round trip time, uh, the round trip time estimate, number of retransmitted, seg uh, retransmitted segments. So we built this into the application, wrapped it all in a logging system. So now we can get this kind of stuff in our log files at the end of selected requests. So I have to say, this has pr proved immensely useful. There's just a wealth of information in here. It doesn't seem to be very highly used. It's not well documented. Uh, but it, it does. this kind of functionality is available in some web servers. So I really recommend trying it out. If you have a chance, you can learn a lot. For us, um, we were able to build a monitoring layer on top of this so that we can generate this data on selected requests uh, for monitoring probes and then collect it back and uh, present the results centrally. And so here's an example of the kind of thing that we were able to pull out of this. Um, so here again, we're, we're back looking at a pop-to-pop -pop grid. Each one of these little graphs is a graph of how the congestion window scales up as a function of the number of requests having been sent over the pool of persistent connections that we have between all of our pairs of POPs. And obviously, we want this congestion window to be as large as possible. Higher congestion window means we can get data transmitted faster and fewer round trips between the POPs. So we got these graphs for the, f for the first time. It was like the fire hose opening up. And we were pretty happy. Uh, it looks like the congestion window scales up quickly, and then it plateaus, looking to us like we were saturating the available bandwidth and making the most effective use out of these connections. But then one day, we realized that we were deceiving ourselves because we had based these graphs on what turned out to be not a representative sample of connections. So when we fixed that, it turned out that the real picture was this, based on a representative sample. And so just to be clear, this is not a degradation. This is just now we had finally seen the way things had always been, which was not bad. Customers are happy with this product generally. But this was another aha moment where we could see, wow, we had seen those graphs before. We thought that's what we wanted it to be like. Turns out it's actually like this. And so that was a case where we got 95% of the way there. From here, you know, ideas started going off, and we had a whole new realm of tweaks and optimizations that we could start to pursue. So some of those are done. Some of those are in the works. And I'd be happy to tell you about those next time. Uh, but for now, I will come back to this. Um, you have to be able to visualize your problems clearly before you have a chance to fix them. And this is not always easy. You have to spend the effort 
and invest the time to build the tools that are specific to your case so that you can visualize what you need to see to be able to understand the problems and see your new opportunities. But it really pays off. It makes for a better and faster experience for your users and for your customers. So thank you for your time. Uh, thanks to these teams at Edgecast that have contributed to what I showed you today. And here's where you can find us online or in person. Thanks.